I came to be in the 50s. As I look back, places and faces have changed. Many vanished from view. But a single memory brings back the years gone by. Food. A reminder of who I was, what I used to do, and the people who were with me. I am the voice of many. Through personal stories, personal archives. This is the collective memory of our food, our history. Park in the 50s was a magical playground, though spartan by today's standards. Future aspirations were reflected in a leftover 50s space age structure. By the 70s, a stadium stood on the site, the home of national pride. In 1980, we won the Malaysia Cup purely on the strength of homegrown talent. For a moment, we were united behind a lion's roar. In 1981, we left the Malaysia Cup. Our lion became a marine specimen and our landscape featured metal and glass. This was the spirit of the early 80s. The beginnings of computers, electronics and westernization. The era in which the balance tipped towards the new world and old food preferences began to fade away. In 1981, the ground was broken for a new concept. Raffle City would be a combined shopping, hotel, office facility, a new playground for the 80s. It was the dawn of the digital age and Singapore perched on the edge of high-tech with components manufacture and value-added services. America became our biggest trading partner with many corporate offices located at Orchard Road. By the 80s, Orchard had become the hotel belt and the place for Western food. Unlike previous generations, the clientele was no longer exclusively foreigners. There's suddenly an awareness of Western cuisine into our lives because there were quite a number of returning students who have studied from abroad and they also brought a bit of uh, the Western taste. People who came back suddenly demanded something new than the local fare. The generation who were born in the 50s and had grown up in tandem with independent Singapore, were now ready for the workforce. This was the generation who had better pay and work conditions. Peter Chan got his first job with Wang Computers. He recalls his fine dining experience at one of the oldest orchard establishments. I found this great menu list from the Goodwood Park Hotel to remind me of the time when I was able to sit down for a big nice meal at a time when only Apati Ang Mos could do so effortlessly because it was charged to the company's entertainment expense. The Gordon Grill was famous for its tender juicy meat on the trolley. Everybody knew about that. For the starter, I chose Scottish smoked salmon. Then I decided on dessert which was cheesecake, a house brand of the hotel. Then I rounded it with Irish coffee. A bottle of red wine was not particularly exciting for me because I knew very little about wine. It was because a bottle would set me back at least $70. When the bill came, I crossed the $200 mark, which was still within my initial estimates. How nice to sign up with an American Express credit card. Visa and MasterCard had not made their presence felt until the 1980s. After I left the hotel, I came down with indigestion. 
it was actually too much for a native Singaporean because our generation never had a big appetite for Western food. The Western food style has a tradition from colonial times, passed down the generations by a specific group of Chinese, the Hainan cooks. In the 50s, 60s, uh, even the 70s, they had this uh, team of husband and wife working both in the family. Uh, the husband probably was the cook, and the wife do, does the household chores of ironing, washing, and all that. And they probably pick up all these Western dishes from the families that they work with. And uh, I think when they left, they probably came out to start on their own. Maybe in the earlier days, I think you have now don't see these restaurants like Cane Hill Steakhouse, Emerald Steakhouse, they are all gone. They could have been started by people like this who have left the uh, uh, services of these uh, armed forces that have left. Shah's Lake Restaurant was started in 1986, but is an offshoot of the iconic Troika. Troika was actually started in 1963, way down in uh, Bras Basa Road. It later moved to um, Liet Towers in uh, July of 1966. When the restaurant closed in December of 1985, uh, most of the staff came out and uh, they couldn't find a job that easily because most of them were, um, shall I classify them as senior citizens because they're in their 50s, late 50s, some even early 60s. Finally, the methody of the restaurant in Troika came to saw this advertisement about this uh, premises here in Fry Shopping Centre for rental. So he decided to ban a couple of them to start up a restaurant. I was roped in because I was colleague with them in Troika for 17 years and um, they decided that they need somebody to do the admin and um, behind the scenes work and then the restaurant started on the 23rd of April in 1986 and, uh, and I suppose the rest you can call it history then. <laughs> we have sort of carried over the uh, food style from the Troika days until here. And in fact, most of the dishes were, I would say, a little modified in the sense that to fit the local palate. So it's still reminiscent of the days of old. Troika's food is the product of knowledge transfer. From working in homes and on board ships, the Western menu is modified to suit local tastes. The carpet bag steak is a piece of scotch fillet stuffed with oysters a surf and turf from 50s Australia. Every Tuesday is oxtail soup day. It had to be prepared the day before. Big Alaska was something that I would say the uh, chef uh, brought over, I would think, if, from the hotel days that he was with in the, I think, 50s, probably in the 50s. The baked Alaska is a pre-war favourite in which ice cream is blanketed with meringue and baked. Irish coffee was, I think, something that had developed from Troika days because in those days there was a lot of these uh, British forces that was in the New Zealand, I think the Australian uh, armed forces was in Singapore. So they were the one actually, I would say, more or less introduced us to that and uh, I think we have adopted it. Now. In those days that they were around, they probably enjoyed that more, especially they like drinking. <laughs> and this is coffee with liquor in it. The Hainanese people are quite clannish and they are very helpful in that sense because they try to get their cousins or some relatives or some friends they know whenever there's a recruitment in any hotels or restaurants, so they pull them in. So in a way, that's how they, uh, you, you would find a majority of them in the FNB trade in the early years. By mid-80s, even this menu was considered old school. By then, many of our food choices veered towards the West. The old ways were about to be destroyed. Get 
the world's worst and most spectacular wildernesses. Yellowstone. Tomorrow, 9 p.m. on Octo. acts that are so bizarre and so intense that they barely scrape through their senses. A documentary series that explores Asia's most edgy and questionable artists and art forms. Wait in Art begins Wednesday 14th September, 10 p.m. only on AOK. Wednesday, 10 p.m., only on AOK. -OK. With iToday, you get the latest news, videos, photos, TV listings of your favourite channel, movie listings, weather, live radio, and more. Now on iPad. Get it free from the App Store. Every Friday night, witness our planet's most breathtaking events and most dramatic stories of survival. Narrated by Sir David Attenborough. Celebrate nature's great events. Beginning 9th September Friday, 9 p.m. on Octo's Animal Night Friday. It's warm, it's comforting, it's morning food. It's greasy. To cut the grease, try the following. Dunk it in hot soya bean milk for 2.6 seconds. Dunk it in hot copio for 1.5 seconds. Dunk it in tissue for a long time. Now consume. Try not to think about the grease. The entrepot trade is in our DNA, the main artery of work at the river. Come the 80s, world competition made it necessary to bring in the cranes, lifting megatons through the air. Trade activity moved to Pase Panjang, leaving the river bereft. In 1983, the Clean River Campaign began and that spelt the end of a life that had given birth to a country. They were very memorable because you had the boats, the colour, the, the reflections of the building on the river was always a sort of psychedelic feeling. And the Singapore River is just a marvellous place to be in. And also for me, a chance to, to look at the other side, to look at uh, another world. Whereas others of, of, uh, of my kind were, were, were stuck in their clubs and their, their little box in their societies. The river at one point was dirty. I mean, it was a lot of silt, dirt and refuse was in there. It was so black that, that at sunset time, around six o'clock, it presented a perfect mirror image for a photographer to take the backdrop of buildings. Ronnie Pinsler grew up under the care of his ama. The attachment to Chinatown continued to his adult years. 
As he developed an interest in photography, he looked in on his own country and saw the fast vanishing world of Chinatown and the Singapore River. I took those pictures of the calligraphers down there, one at the end of the junction and the other one a little bit further down. They had a lot of business around Chinese New Year. There were queues of people waiting to do their decorations. So up the hill, a sorority club where there were some nice old ladies. And on the steps were the maches, the, um, the retired maches who were living here in the sorority house. One of them at least had a water pipe in her hand that she was smoking. Ronnie started to document the vanishing world, the results of which is a collection of 15,000 films and photos. Today, he recalls the last days of the Boat Key area from his photographic memory. I don't think I could have walked past this point because uh, the bridge, Reed Bridge, cut right across into the Rhone. There was a small flight of stairs that you went up and you were into a busy thoroughfare with lorries and buses. A lot of the river people, the Tuakaos, were living down here. Right at this corner was a hairdresser. I remember he was a bald man, yet he used to shave people's head. He had his old um, dental hairdresser chair right on the corner. He didn't have a shop, it was just on the pavement. And these shop houses were, were all go-downs, warehouses, uh, offices, charterers for, for boats. For example, there were boats that carried the maches, the armors, back onto the, the ships that would take them back to Siamen, Fujian, Guangdong, wherever they were going. The retired maches who'd finished their quest and preferred not to go to Sago Lane, but to go back home to China to die. And at any one time, you'd have two or three hundred on a weekend amassing here, mostly dressed in white and black, white tops and their black pajamas, their pigtails in the back. And they'd get on the sampans and go out to sea. The temple was the main gathering place and the site of annual feast days and wayangs, the only form of street entertainment. The temple had something like 40 days of wayang in a year, and at least 20 of them were against the back wall that I was talking about. Usually it would be a Teochew wayang, the Lao Che Ki Hien, or Sin Yong Wa Heng, or th those kind of opera troops. And then there would be chairs placed back, and sometimes a puppet theater would be here as well. A um, lot of children, a lot of people, at any one time, you could have two, three hundred people watching these shows. They're, they're the big events of the year. And this was the central hub of the whole area. Where there are wayangs, there is the inevitable food. In the past, hawkers were as much a feature of the street opera as the performance itself. A frequent food found at Wayang's would be the Chinese roja. When we say roja, we mean the version mixed with vegetables and fruit. This dish is a child of mixed cultures, with a name from Indonesian origins. The crux of a roja is the dressing. Heko or fermented prawn paste mixed with peanuts, sugar, optional chili and asam juice. Essential ingredients include tau kwa, toasted yu jia kue, pineapple, cucumbers, bang kwang, bean sprouts, topped with a generous garnish of more crushed peanuts. In the old days, rojak sellers used to move around on push carts, a wooden box with ingredients shown through glass panels. From the 80s, the Rojak stall stayed put and became a feature in almost any hawker centre. 
Where I'm standing now was entirely roadway. I don't remember this. I think this has been put in. So you had to go onto the pedestrian's side and walk along. The storyteller was probably located around this point. And next to him was a cigarette stall and maybe there was a, a durian cellar on the pavement on the other side. Remember, this was a busy intersection. All the time, noise, lorries, cars. You know, I'm always looking around waiting for a lorry to run me down, but there's none coming because this is now in a pedestrian walkway. You, you got Upengyu, stay here. You got friends, stay here. You ask me? Yeah. I ask who? <laughs> <laughs> you remember the, the people sell the cigarette before? Yeah, the, yeah, he wear yeah. the glasses, yeah? yeah. Hey, you remember the Mache? When Mache finished, already no more working, want to go back to China. Come here, take boat, and then go to the sea. Ah, yeah. gotcha. The boat take them out, yeah? How do you know? Because I hear la, I'm not so young, you know. No more already. No more, all finished. Singapore so changed, yeah? You like new Singapore? <laughs> Goodbye. Next Bye. time free, come okay, and see you. Thank you. Say, say, Mr. Wong, okay? Bye-bye. Okay. So, the Ellenborough Market was right over here. It led right onto the river. There were the old, um, almost 19th century look, wooden steps leading out and poles. And of course, there was the backdrop of all those boats, similar to those tourist boats that we see on the water there. And there was a busy thoroughfare of people walking and wasn't a, a road but uh, tri shores bicyclists motorcyclists a copy tiam on the corner the market extended for 200 yards and then you had the flats where the market people lived you would know it was a market because there were so many boxes of uh, vegetables lettuce you know and then of course there were tri shores bicyclists even some of the people resting against some of the the trees that were along here Maybe these were the original trees. But this particular lane was rather pleasant to walk. I remember particularly in the early morning, along sunset, and get the view across the river and walk towards uh, Coleman Street and Coleman Bridge along the end there. For 10 years, Ronnie filmed all aspects of the Singapore River, and the images we see today are records of its final moments. The photographer was almost looked at as the man with the scythe, with the black cape inside, the shadow of death. Because we, we were coming really to the last shots of the area and I sensed that very much. Some of the locals who were there regarded us photographers as basically symbols of death, but that we only come in and show interest at the last moment, but we don't care about it when it's fine and going on. By 1987, river life came to an end. Only the shop houses stood derelict in wait for the next blow. There are three things you might want to know about chocolates. Number one, why does this chocolate melt in your mouth, not in your hands? Number two, what makes white chocolate white? Number three, why is chocolate an aphrodisiac? Get some chocolates and watch Modern Marvels. Tuesday, 9 p.m. on Octo. It was a great collaboration between Mediacorp and its partners. The police drama series Cliff enjoyed top ratings in 2011 to date. 
We chose to work with Mediacorp because television is great for creating the emotional link with the audience. The drama series has not only generated greater interest in the police, it has also offered the deeper insights into how the police fight crime. To reach your target audience, there's still nothing quite as powerful as Mediacorp channels. Are your kids between 2 to 6 years old? Then bring them down to Octo's Curious Tots event this school holidays. Get their hands on the giant bowling ball and play in the giant ball pit. Join the fun by creating sculptures with your children. And also take a picture with Ollie and your whole family. So be sure to head on down to Marina Square. A fun-filled weekend for you and your family. Curious Tots, 9th to 11th September. For more information, please visit cinemsn.com slash Octo. Curious Tots, presented by Octo, in partnership with Friso, the new advanced Friso shield with P2 dual system. In the 80s, breakfast food like Tui Kwe and Yu Jia Kwe were no longer bought off streets, but from hawker centres. Back then though, hawkers still made them from scratch. The term Kwe is dialect for dough. The Yu Cha Kwe is built of nothing more than rice flour, salt and water. The Cantonese named these devils after a pair of 12th century traitors who should have been fried in oil. The same oil is used to fry other doughy snacks. This interflavoring gives a unique taste to the Yuja Kwe. As a basic fried dough, it gives texture to other dishes like the roja and the porridge. Such is the mix of our Chinese heritage. By the 80s, Chinatown was no longer an enclave, but an embarrassing contrast to the gleaming towers nearby. The area known as Bullock Cart Street was officially dubbed Chinatown for the tourists. They realized that tourists can come to Singapore. They want to look at old places. So we started a Singapore tourist promotion board. And we had to retain some of the old buildings, particularly in Chinatown. And that was I was involved. And I was the first to train the tourist guides in Singapore. And I took them to all the sites and taught them and set the examination and so forth, you see because they stopped things being destroyed in Chinatown. So we covered 50 weeks through the year, and then there was a big exam. So everyone had to have written exam and spoken exam, and then you got a badge, and you were licensed uh, tour guides. Geraldine considers herself a street walker and Singapore's oldest tourist guide. Chinatown was never just Chinese. You know, when Raffles came, it was Indian and Malay, the Malay village, fishing villages, and Cross Street was called Kampong Susu. It was Indians, and that's why you still find the Hindu temples and the mosques in the middle of Chinatown, or what is Cantonese Chinatown. Along here were the Boyon Pondo, you know, the living quarters of these uh, Boyanese families who came from a small island off the coast of Indonesia. And uh, eventually they all moved, so they left two of them here. And um, 
They were very skillful, as I said, making fenders for the boats and bending the thick uh, rattans and canes. But they were also very skillful to make scaffolding. So if you look at this scaffolding, uh, mistakenly it's always called bamboo. Maybe in China and Hong Kong they use bamboo, but in Southeast Asia, Singapore, we always use, uh, this is the wood from a special palm tree called the Nibong palm. Uh, it's a very hard wood and it uh, grows in the swamp, so it's salt resistant. This is the same wood they use for the kelongs. And um, they would strip this, of course in the old days it was rattan, I think now it's plastic. So <laughs> this is modernization, but it's a very um, special way of you know, tying it all together. Chinatown always had a draw during major festivals like Chinese New Year and the Mooncake Festival. The big attraction would be the food. That is all that remains today when festive activities have been put aside. James Xia remembers one Mooncake Festival in 1959. I waited patiently as my mother unwrapped a foldable lantern and handed it to me. Every year for the past five years, she had repeated the same ritual. The lantern must have cost quite a sum in those days. A group of young terrorists with a rubber band shooter, a small piece of the ring folded in half, was used like an arrow. On impact, the lantern would catch fire and destroy. That night, my precious rooster lantern went up in flame within minutes. My mother did not scold or scream at me though. I understood her feelings and told her that I would stop carrying lantern. I did not want her to buy me another lantern, comforting her with the excuse that I was too old to be carrying lanterns at age 10 the following year. I really miss the rooster lantern. It would have been a collector's item. Chinatown was always a collage of colour and chaos. Life and death coexisted without qualm. This was where Geraldine used to visit with her ama in the pre-war years. I remember once uh, going to a funeral of one of her friends in um, Sego Lane and um, we had this big feast and then only at the end, I turned around and I realized that there was a coffin there and there was somebody dead in it. I was you know, too young to realize, I just thought we were having a dinner. It was next to the coffin shops that one store sold our most cherished festive food. The bakwa is a Hokkien pork jerky, but when it got to Singapore, it took on local flavors and color. Zhaoqi 扁担两边呢，一边就是放火物嘛，哈，一边就是放炉了，所以这样的一种现烤现卖的这种肉干比较受欢迎嘛。A real bakwa is sliced pork marinated in fish sauce and sugar. The essential element is heat to impart a smoky flavor. 很多国家都有肉干，比如说泰国有泰国的肉干，中国也有它的肉干，包括西方国家。比如说美国的左边跟右边的一些店铺都是卖棺材的
。我现在想起来说，呃，如果要我们在卖棺材的地方再开一间美珍像，我看在在现在是不大可能的。我们的生意比较快速的发展呢，是在一九八零年后了。那么主要也是跟随新加坡的经济的发展了。游客来新加坡一定要买肉干哦。当然，我们到国外，我们也会去发展其他的，比如说我们到韩国，啊，我们就会去做当地的，比如说 kimchi 肉干啊。去到中国，可能成都，我们就会做啊麻辣的肉干嘛。哦，不过我们主要的主力还是我们的传统肉干啊，啊，是这样的。In the 80s, with higher incomes and increased tourist numbers. The Bakwa business took off not only locally but worldwide. It is now firmly established as a Singapore food icon. Chinatown in the early 80s was on the verge of major changes. The traditional shophouse business would soon disappear, giving way to another form of settlement. Adding another character to Chinatown food today. Our heritage has always been multicultural, but we became conscious of this only when outsiders took notice. It was in the early 80s that we set up and paid attention to an area dubbed Little India. I was lucky enough to have some excellent teachers who encouraged me to be the very best that I could be, and that's what I want to do for every single girl in my school. I want my girls to know that they can do anything; that they don't have to repeat the mistakes the previous generation made. Specifically, blindly sending their sons off to be killed in their millions without thought, without question. If I'm appointed, of course. Catch up those Teachers' Day special. South Riding begins tomorrow, 10 p.m. on AOK. By the most intimate insights of the world's greatest land predator, polar bear, spy on the ice. Part two of a two-part special, Wednesday, 9 p.m. on Octo's Animal Night Wednesday. Welcome to the Master Chef Kitchen. You're a bit of a lamb king, apparently, yeah? Yeah. I hear that Nick's writing a cookbook about lamb. I'm scared. I taste rosemary. I taste lamb. That is incredible. Well done. Okay. <laughs> Junior Master Chef Tuesday, 8 p.m. on Octo. Mm. Heart attack, a silent killer that may occur without warning signs, making it one of the leading causes of death in Singapore. Join four experts as they share vital information on caring for the heart and the latest innovations in cardiac health. A serious matter of the heart happening 10th September at the Conrad Centennial Singapore Ballroom Level Two. Book your tickets now to enjoy special rates. For more details, log on to channelnewsasia.com/seminar. Monday. I'll be there.
Once chopsticks had to be reused, then disposables came along. Lightweight, hygienic, stuck together. Some common mistakes made in splitting. Wrong angle. Too low. Wrong axis. No twisting. Wrong end up. Wrong, wrong, wrong. To make a perfect split, place base on a level surface. Move your fingers to the tip. Pull apart on the x-axis swiftly. Polish to remove splinters. Now they are ready for use and throw away. Little India was what the tourists called the area of Sarangan Road. By the 80s, most of the residents moved out and the area became a shopping and dining precinct. Singapore's Indian community is made up mostly of South Indians, Muslims and Hindus. Their contribution to our food has been more than significant. The mee goreng, for example, is a Tamil Muslim adaptation of fried noodles mixed with tomato ketchup, curry powder and mutton pieces. Authentic Tamil dishes have been adopted as part of our culinary culture. From the Tamil Muslim, we are given the biryanis and the teh tare. At home, for example, you will find that Indians have got uh, the traditional utensils for drinking coffee. Two places, you know, one is a round flat one, another one is a little, like a tumbler. So what you do is you take that one and you cool down it and you cool it down and then after that you drink. That's why the two things are given, you see. So this is as an extension of that idea became the big tare, you see. So actually it was just to cool your tea, which is normally when you go to Indian home, they leave it. Now we are giving tablets. In those days you give this one. And quite often you find they don't use the leaf to eat because of saliva. They'll actually take the tea, open your mouth and pour it this way because others can use the same tumbler. And eventually when you go into a coffee shop, you big quantity, you see. So you have to do this way <laughs> to serve the tea. Many of the restaurants originally catered to the migrant Tamil worker who came to Singapore without families, without cooking skills. Most of the people who came in, they came in as workers to work in factories or you know, to do construction job, road building. So they were not trained uh, in cooking. They don't have facilities, somehow they won't have time also. And they depended more on us to... Because I remember as a young boy, I used to carry lunch packets and go to their place of work to distribute the lunch packets. K. Nadarajan's grandfather opened our oldest Hindu vegetarian restaurant in 1924. It brought to labourers traditional food prepared by cooks of a certain pedigree. To cook vegetarian food, you've got to come from a Brahmin family. So a Brahmin is uh, considered as the best person to cook vegetarian food. Those days there were a lot of Brahmins in our shop and I learned it first and from them. They can cook normal lunch, dinner, you know, those sweets and savouries. None can beat them. The Tamil vegetarian menu is diverse, ranging from spicy to sweet. The staple is rice. But dose, the rice and lentil pancake, is just as popular. Unlike the generations before, Nadarajan was locally born and bred, passing through all the Singapore rites of passage. The food which I, as a young boy, which I couldn't eat in my house, I could go to the tuck shop there, I don't know, eat mee siam. So for me it was... <laughs> Maybe I didn't like school life, but I like the tuck shop food. <laughs> I come from a vegetarian family, and I was a vegetarian till the day I stepped into the camp. 
When I found out for vegetarian food, they gave me just a vegetable soup or vegetable and rice. When I found it's not making any sense, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I won't be getting my full protein intake and all that. So I clo one day I closed my eyes and started eating meat. <laughs> if not for Anas, I would not have known what the taste of meat is like. Initially, there was some disturbances within me that I broke the family tradition. But later on, I got to enjoy the food. Then with, uh, after eating it in NS with my army friends, when we book out on weekends, we used to go out and eat different foods. <laughs> so it was really uh, like Christmas came, you know. Because of his Singapore roots, Nadarajan hoped to preserve our heritage through food. The Te Tare was once performed by waiters in front of customers. Pouring and pulling hot liquids into palm-sized vessels is a skill requiring practiced rhythm and timing. Those days, when you come to our outlets, what we used to do is, when you order a coffee or tea, the waiter will bring it and he will cool the coffee. That's the purpose of this tare, is to cool the coffee or tea. It's mm. totally vanished, no more in Singapore. So we revived it, brought it back for the benefit of Singaporeans. The putu is a South India breakfast dish made of ground rice and coconut. The putu bola is a Singapore creation but is now extinct. Those days when they make a spring opus putumayam or idiapam, the remaining flour was converted into putubola. I don't think in India they have it. It is a food item native to both Malaysia and Singapore. This thing was totally vanished. It was totally forgotten. We were searching for this recipe. Then we had to send somebody over to Penang to locate a maker who was previously done in Singapore, and we got a recipe from him. So we were able to make this. It's actually a forgotten tradition. So now we have you know, brought it back, and we are thinking of ways to, how to reintroduce it to the Singapore market again. The Putu Mayam was a childhood favourite for many who grew up in the 50s and 60s. Represented by the man with a basket on his head, the putumayam or string hoppers is made with ground rice flour pressed through a mould and steam. It takes on a local identity with its serving of red or brown sugar. Sadly, putumayam is no longer made in Singapore. And of course, well, Putumayam was a bit bigger because of this demonstration purpose. So we are making it small today. All these uh, recipes, we have put it into our system. It's in our computer. So future generations uh, will be able to extract and recreate it. When I was young, I thought it was a curse for me to be born in this business. Uh, because my you know, guys my age eh, used to go and have the weekends off. I, they used to have a good time partying and all that. I used to envy all of them. And I think this is a curse in my life. I was born in this thing and I had to stick in this business. Then later then we, I found out that money is better than working outside. <laughs> so I stood my ground here. <laughs> now I don't regret it. K. Nadarajan passed away soon after this interview. The collection of lost recipes remains in the hands of future generations. The 80s landscape was the result of two decades of reorganization. New landmarks overshadowed the derelict New highways and bridges replaced old roads. 
a new airport opened doors to a new city. Through this, millions of visitors came each year. But through the same portal, many Singaporeans left, some for the first and some for the last time. In the coming decades, the world grew smaller and our boundaries no longer limited to an island. As the millennium drew to a close, what impact would a global world have on us? Our food, our history continues.